Oh, you've heard the saying, cuter than a June bug, snug as a bug in a rug, and some days you're the windshield and some days you're the bug. We're on the road again for this episode of the Paul Report. We travel to the Douglas Hart Nature Center in Mattoon for all things, you guessed it, bugs. Stay with us. Paul Report on WEIU is supported by Rural King, America's farm and home store, livestock feed, farm equipment, pet supplies, and more. You can find your store and more information regarding Rural King at RuralKing.com. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Paul Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. Well, surprise, all of our guests watching the Paul Report for this episode. We are not in the studio. We decided to pack up the gear and head to Douglas Hart Nature Center uh, in Mattoon, Illinois. So thank you all for joining us. And we are joined by Hannah. Okay, I'm going to let Hannah because I said, I kept saying Schwanky and she's like, nope, nope. Schwanky. Hannah Schwanky, that's Got right. Got it, Hannah Schwanky. She's joining us for this episode. So Hannah, yes. uh, we always put new guests on the spot. We have you introduce yourself, talk about your position here at, at Douglas Hart and all that good stuff. Okay. Um, so I'm Hannah Schwanky. I'm the Land Stewardship Director here at the Douglas Hart Nature Center. Um, been here for about six years, started off as an intern, so my background is in environmental and wildlife biology and conservation. Um, got my bachelor's there, um, started working here and have been here since. Um, so with the Land Stewardship Director position, I do the conservation. So we don't work really directly with summer camps. We still do stuff with our CCI program. So those are our like high school aged conservation volunteers that are amazing and work out here with us um, on this little over 70 acres out here. Yes. Um, but we do habitat restoration, um, land management, planting natives to help wildlife, doing stuff with like, we've installed nesting boxes, things like that before. Um, um, we do prescribed burning out here, um, things like that. Do a lot of invasive removal. Um, and let's see, so something else we do out here too. Um, in addition to the conservation, we do, you know, do some out outreach and things like that and try to get more people interested in conservation and kind of why we do what we do. Um, you do a lot of it's outdoor a lot. <laughs> work. And so just so our viewers understand, we are filming this episode of The Paul Report. Uh, end of July. Today is July 26th, I believe. And I was talking to Hannah. We were getting to know each other before the interview. And I said, boy, oh boy, last week uh, it was in the 100 degree range. <laughs> and you have quite the job outside do, uh, yeah. during the summer. Now today it's very nice. And we're both wearing jeans <laughs> and it's comfortable. Um, but you have a hot job, um, yes. but very rewarding. It's extremely rewarding. Yeah. So Every time, you know, you think about the heat or all the, you know, the mosquitoes and things like that out here, you know, you just think about, you know, when we do remove invasives or plant natives, just think about all the good that you're doing for the environment and for nature. And in addition to kind of the habitats and stuff, we do a lot of programming and things out here. So doing trail maintenance and, you know, with, you know, our limestone trails, mulching trails and our specialty areas, keeping those maintained as well. Um, so we, we have a lot on our plate for sure, but it's very rewarding. So, yes. <laughs> you know, some some viewers out there may not um, know what Douglas Hart Nature Center is. Maybe they've never visited here. So I think it's important for those not familiar with the center. Yeah. Uh, tell us all about it. And you mentioned it was 70 acres, but um, there's more to the facility and there's so much out here to do. Yes, absolutely. So. Um, it all started, um, so our very first property, um, besides the Nature Center, was Friendship Garden, which was founded in 1963, um, and it's modeled after an English tea garden. Um, so Helen, our founder, Helen Douglas Hart, did a lot of traveling, went to England a lot, and so that's what that's modeled after, and the offices were originally in the houses, and she lived in the houses across the street from there. Um, and then a little bit later, she went in an area where people could experience all three natural habitats in Illinois. 
um, I guess four if you count um, kind of a savanna area. So prairie, uh, wetland, and woodland. Um, and so they start off by planting around 10,000 trees here. They're about the size of pencils, so just little bitty things. Um, but a lot of people don't know that this was all restored habitat. So none of it, it was all farmland um, that they took out of production. And then almost 60 years later, this is what we have today. Um, so we have our three habitats. Um, in total, the property here is a little over 70 acres. And then we also have our specialty areas. So around our wetland, just right over there, we have our bog garden. So we have pitcher plant, um, Venus flytrap, uh, sundew, oh, so some carnivorous plants, yes. which is really cool. The kids love that. I bet, yes. <laughs> um, so that's really awesome. And it's just right, right over there, right behind us. And we have our uh, butterfly garden towards the front of the nature center. So that has a lot of our pollinator-friendly plants in it. Um, a bird garden. Um, which is right behind the center. So which is right you, behind. When you walk in, you just see everything. It's right there. Around. It's very neat. So very cool. Um, and then we also have um, some water areas. So we have a dragonfly pond. Um, we have a lot of frogs, tadpoles. We actually found some little baby painted turtles and some snappers in there. Wow. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, and of course, as the name implies, a lot of dragonflies kind of hang out around there. Um, we have an ephemeral pond, which is in our South Prairie. And um, an ephemeral pond it means it doesn't hold water all the time. So it's just kind of temporarily filled. Um, and it's perfect for frogs and salamanders for breeding because, of course, with the water not being in there year round, you don't have the fish, so they don't have that predation risk. Um, so we have kind of the habitats and then all of our specialty areas. Um, and then as you've probably seen and kind of heard a lot of the kids and stuff out here, so we also host a lot of um, like festivals, uh, summer camps right now, um, programs, things like that. Um, so we do, I think they did this year around 75 summer camps. <laughs> wow, a lot of kids, so, a lot of exposure. A lot of and kids. And you know it's getting them outside and experiencing uh, something that they probably just don't get to do on a daily basis. Exactly. And so kind of one of our, our mission, we do, you know, providing programs and volunteer opportunities for all ages um, to kind of get that experience with nature, um, to kind of further understand and then to appreciate it. Um, and to kind of enjoy spending time out here and kind of learning about what we do and everything and the importance of it. Well, I was going to say, so our viewers at home probably are thinking, you know, Kelly, the show is a pet show. And so <laughs> why are you taking it on the road to Douglas Art Nature Center? Well, I thought instead of doing an episode necessarily on pests, uh, pets, we would do an episode on pests. P-E-S-T-S. <laughs> and so that's why we brought it on the road. So Hannah's the expert, and I'm curious um, how many different types of, or, or I guess let's, let's just go even further. What is an insect, and how many different insects appear in the state of Illinois? Yes, so insects are one of the biggest group uh, groups of animals, not just in Illinois, but just on Earth. Um, so an insect is an animal that has, so what they have is an, ex, an exoskeleton. Um, so they are invertebrates with an exoskeleton, um, kind of that hard outer shell um, that protects them, um, which is made out of chitin, which is just a really strong, really strong material, um, which is another reason why they're so successful. Um, and they also have three body segments, so a head, thorax, and an abdomen um, with three, set, three pairs of legs, so six legs in total, um, usually two antennae. Um, and there's just in Illinois we have that have been detected and kind of known of around 20,000 species. 20? Around 20,000 just in it. Illinois. Just here. Just, just in here. Illinois. Oh my goodness. Well, what about it? Douglas Hart here. I, I, you know, I don't know if you do um, any <laughs> testing or capturing or whatever, but any, any number? Here, I of? really have no idea. Thousands, here. probably. Thousands. <laughs> I mean, if there's 20,000 in, um, I would in the state. I would, we see, you know, tons of insects all the time, so I would love to do, love to be able to capture and do counts or do some more tagging and things, but um, we don't really do, you know, I know they do like monarch tagging and they have mm -hmm. in the past. Other insects, we don't, but I would love to see what those, what those numbers look like. <laughs> well, let's talk about some of the insects that we find locally. I mean, I can think of... I can think of a few that drive me, you know, scratchy and itchy, but uh, what, type of, what type of insects do we find, or we can find in our, our backyards okay. here? Um, so some of the most common ones are, you know, bees, butterflies, beetles, praying mantises, 
um, wasps, moths. Um, you get lots of ants. Um, let's see. Um, right now, Flies. I actually saw a lot of, or starting to see cicadas. Oh, cicadas out and about. Boy, and oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> Is this the season for the big singing of the it's cicadas? It's kind of getting there, yeah. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. I didn't mean to interrupt, but cicadas no, are, you're fine. are very vocal. They're very vocal, yes. Um, and kind of talking about like cicadas and with the exoskeletons and stuff, so you might be seeing kind of a lot around like trees and stuff, and in your yard we've been seeing more and more um, kind of their exoskeleton shells. Um, so those are pretty cool to find. And then I saw, I think, the first cicada um, hmm. the other day in our South Prairie. So <laughs> Wow. Now, as far as um, how do we identify? I mean, I think people can identify with a mosquito or a fly, but if somebody is out there thinking, I wonder what that is, you know, maybe it's a weird looking centipede or um, a caterpillar-ish looking uh, a woolly with big, you know, antenna or uh, antennae. Yeah. How would you go about <laughs> identifying specifically? Ooh, so that's kind of, so that's kind of tricky. So I know with like, um, a lot of people with like butterflies and moths, Mm -hmm. um, they'll see something and they're like, how do I know what, you know, what the, you know, if that's a butterfly or a moth. Um, so typically with a moth, you can kind of tell because the body will be, the body will be a lot more like fuzzy. It's not going to be in their antenna. Um, so with a butterfly, they're going to be almost like super thin and then kind of have a knob, hmm. almost like a dot at the top versus okay. a moth that's going to be a lot more like feathery looking. Um, but with like flies, wasps, bees, and things like that, it's really hard to kind of um, to kind of pinpoint or to kind of ID and kind of separate them. Another really good um, like thing to have too um, is field guides. So this is a really good one from the National Wildlife Federation. Um, if you're interested with doing more like insect identification and things like that, um, any of those bugs on the endangered or threatened mm -hmm. list? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> um, so like, as you mentioned, monarchs, um, they are on kind of the decline, and I think you had mentioned that they were on, if they're, I don't know if they're endangered yet, but um, kind of with how everything's going, I wouldn't doubt it, as mm -hmm. sad as it is. Um, a lot of our bee species, native bee species, are on the decline as well. Um, so with the, through the IDNR, so we do have Endangered, there's the rusty patched bumblebee. Um, that one oh. is endangered. Um, we have a skimmer, um, a dragonfly species that's endangered as well, um, a leaf hopper. Um, we have um, a couple that are threatened. We have a leaf hopper, um, um, the royal, or sorry, the regal fritillary, um, which is a butterfly that's, it, that's threatened as well. Um, and then talking about like the rattlesnake master and stuff. So it's there's a specific butterfly that actually bores, and it actually needs needs it as the host plant, um, and so it's on the threatened threatened list mm -hmm. as well, which is sad. Are most of these species is it environmental um, reasonings? Their habitats are just on the decline. I definitely think that's the case. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then I've also know with a lot of people with lawns and stuff, just chemical use and mm -hmm. and things like that, which which unfortunately you know a lot of people do, but it's it is causing a decline for a lot of them. And some of the species bugs that bite, <laughs> bugs that I want <laughs> that um, we should try to stay away from. Yes. Um, so a lot of what we have out here, we've been cutting doing a lot of like cutting trees, you know, unwanted trees and things like that. And we've been coming across a lot of carpenter, big carpenter ants. Really? <laughs> and they, they bite, they're nasty. Um, when you um, say big? They're pretty good size ants. <laughs> <laughs> and they bite. <laughs> and they bite, they're like big black ants. Um, so you'll see them, them around a lot if you're outdoors a lot. Um, um, another one, of course, is everyone's really familiar with is mosquitoes. Sure. Um, Ticks. Uh, and ticks. <laughs> um, we've been having, haven't really noticed previously too many ticks. Um, and then this year it seems like, especially our interns and things, um, one of them has had one that was um, actually in her, in her skin and everything. But we've had a lot of issues with ticks and stuff this year. Mm -hmm. um, Various types of ticks. You've got the deer tick. Deer um, tick. Um, there's a dog, like a dog tick dog as tick. well. Um, but they carry, 
can carry diseases as well. Same with the mosquitoes, you know, the Zika virus, malaria. Um, so it's always, you know, j good to be really cautious, mm -hmm. you know, around here um, with bug spray and things like that. Um, another one, I don't know if too many people are familiar with, they're called assassin bugs. Mm. Um, so they kind of look like, um, like kind of like the leaf-footed bugs and stuff. Um, but if you come in contact with one of those, they can they can bite and they, they sting pretty good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so they're not one that you would want to, you know, pick up or come in like? contact with. So they kind of have a flat, kind of a flat body um, and like longer legs and everything. I'm trying to think, I don't even, I don't know if we have a, have a specimen of one. Um, but they're called assassin bugs. Called assassin well, bugs. Well, you'll know it when you get, <laughs> do they bite or sting? They I bite. I guess it's, ooh. Yeah, it's, it's nasty. <laughs> what about those occasional invaders? Um, insects that just sporadically enter your home, um, like a pill bug or a millipede or something yeah, like crickets that. Crickets. Crickets, yes, <laughs> crickets. Especially in crawl spaces. We had an issue with that. Yes. Where, I mean, they get in and multiply. Yeah, so um, one thing with those, I know a lot of people get them in their houses. I know right now, like our house, not too many ants and stuff, but we'll get a lot of like crickets and stuff coming in. Um, so really a thing to kind of keep in mind with that, um, like if you have any spaces kind of outside, making sure stuff's sealed up, you know, that there's no, you know, cracks and stuff that they're going to get into through your house, windows, doors, anything like that. Um, and also making sure there's not kind of like a puddle or pools of water making it, you know, where they're going to kind of be drawn into your mm -hmm. house. Mm -hmm. um, so just kind of keeping those things in mind. Um, something else a lot of people do is like with pest control or things like that um, if it's something that gets really out of hand you know contacting someone like that as well what about some when I when I think of insects what, <laughs> what can be fun about insects right uh, but let's talk about some fun facts I'm interested to know about the largest insect in the state and then yes. maybe any other fun things that you can share um, with our viewers um, about bugs Yes, so the largest insect in Illinois is the Cecropia moth. The what moth? <laughs> Cecropia. So this one, so if I would have it on the palm of my hand right now, it's about six, the wingspan is about six to seven inches long, so it would easily take up my entire hand. <laughs> wow. Um, and it's kind of like a reddish brown color and kind of a black and gray. So it's, it's a really pretty moth. Um, and I don't know, um, we had one at one of our other properties, Whiteside. Um, but they're, they're really cool to come across, but I... I don't think I've ever come across one out here before, but mm -hmm. it's it's kind of sad too. But it's kind of rare to kind of rare to stumble upon one of those as well. Um, but they're very very cool looking insects. The IDNR has a pretty substantial collection of bugs. They do seven million. <laughs> seven million. Seven million, million bugs. It's crazy. In um, a museum, I'm, I I don't know where it's located, um, but but they do have a very large specimen uh, yes. <laughs> display. <laughs> That's insane. I can't imagine having having that many. <laughs> you know, having that many. Speaking of display. specimens, you, you brought actually out here with us um, some various things that we can potentially show our viewers about backyard bugs. Yes. Let's see. Let's go with this one here. So this is one. So this is, of course, one of the cicadas. Mm -hmm. So you'll start seeing those more and more, and you'll, you'll definitely hear them for sure. <laughs> What's in the case with the cicada? So these are just some of the, I believe just some of the parts with them. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you can tell that the, kind of busted up there a little bit, but. They're big and they're loud. Big and loud, yes. You'll definitely, definitely hear them. What else did you bring along? Let's see here. A couple, couple of boxes. Yeah. So, family of wasps. So these are some of our wasps. <laughs> What's the big guy up here on the left? Let's see. So this one is actually one. So speaking of cicadas, this is a cicada killer. <laughs> oh. So we. I actually saw one of those the other day when we were in the woodland. So um, that's a really really cool wasp. Um, Why do you think and. You know, it's habitats like Douglas Hart that insects, you know, when you said there's thousands of species in Illinois, why they're so successful. So, habitats. 
So definitely with habitat. So talking about like I had mentioned before with like the exoskeleton, and so they have that kind of protective outer, kind of outer like layer, as you would say, um, kind of on their bodies. Um, and as you can tell from a lot of these specimens, they're really small. And of course, insects, they can fly. Um, so they're able to kind of avoid, avoid predators in that way. Um, and being tiny, they can also go into a lot of habitat and a lot of spaces that other animals can't. Mm -hmm. um, so they can hide and they can fly and they can be in <laughs> tall places where, where other things just can't get there. They can't get there. Let's talk about, um, I've got a garden at home and I can't seem to keep stuff out of my garden. What are the big garden attractors that we should keep an eye out? What specific insects like to to feast on on your uh, <laughs> your vegetables and other other items um, in your garden. So one thing we have, I guess we kind of mentioned previously, was talking about Japanese beetles. Um, so they're one that will commonly um, kind of invade your garden. And the bad thing about them is that they're attracted to trees, shrubs, wildflowers, veggies. So everything. <laughs> everything. <laughs> Nothing is really is really safe with them um, in terms of your garden. Um, and kind of going back really quick, so something else that makes insects really su successful, um, a lot of people are really familiar with the monarch um, yes. and probably the other butterfly that looks almost identical, um, the vis viceroy. Mm -hmm. viceroy. Um, so it's one, so monarchs are actually, can be toxic to um, their, their predators and everything. And so they've, the other butterfly have kind of taken on those colorations, that way they can avoid predators that way as well. So predators think, okay, it's orange and, you know, it's, I'm going to stay away from it. And so by taking on those colors, they're able to avoid predators. Um, and it's like that, too, a lot of the times with, um, like, people associate the colors, like, black and yellow with wasps and bees. Mm -hmm. And so they're thinking, okay, we got to stay away from those. And there's a lot of, like, beetles, like soldier beetles that are black and yellow that are completely harmless. And so they're able to avoid predators that way because they think, oh, it's, you know, something dangerous. We should stay away from it. And mm. so that's another reason is because of that mimicry and some of these other things that mm -hmm. insects have adapted. I'm going to ask you about, a little bit more about the Japanese beetle mm -hmm. because I have them in my yard and it's yes. amazing. We have these those bags that attract them and I mean it's just like instant where they're attracted to that smell and they get in, yeah. into the bags. Um, you said they're attracted mm -hmm. to all types of vegetation. Do they have a season? I mean, do they come out at a certain period of time? Obviously, we're filming During again the in the summer. summer. In the summer, yeah, that's usually when um, when they'll be most active. And everything is during the summer. What about the ash borer? So, emerald ash borer. So that's another one that's um, just like the Japanese beetle. It's native to Asia. Um, it came over through lumber and everything. Um, and we actually have a piece of bark here. So. If you're not familiar with the emerald ash borer, so it specifically targets ash trees. Um, and a lot of the ones we have out here are green and white ash. And if you come out here, you can see a lot of our trees have been cut down. Um, and a lot of those that are along the trail is because of this emerald ash borer. So you can see on the trunk and even on the piece of bark, you can really see kind of this trailing through, which is where mm -hmm. the larvae have been, have been eating, oh, have been eating the bark. Really tell. So, yeah, and if you if you leave them, does it just completely destroy the tree? It'll completely kill the tree. Yeah, in no time at all. <laughs> really? And when you say um, no time at all, I mean, is it days, weeks, months, years, or is it something quicker? Um, let's see. So we had um, we noticed an issue with them that we had an issue with them, and it was a few years later, and all of our oh. trees are gone. <laughs> Um, we do have some like little bitty ones and stuff that kind of around the site that we noticed, but in probably five to ten years, once they get bigger, they're going to be dead as well, unfortunately. Well, let's um, talk about something good. We've got about a minute left in our discussion, and I want to attract good bugs yes. to, my, <laughs> to my yard and my property. What kind of habitats can I create to attract the good things? Yes, so one thing that's really popular right now, um, we've had some people contact us about this, is a pollinator habitat. So you don't have to have a huge area like this, you know, to attract bugs um, and good insects and things like that. Um, so all you need is you want to have a lot of good native plants and diversity is key. So you want to have lots of different colors, shapes, smells to attract as much as you want. Greatest diversity of pollinators. Um, 
um, like butterfly milkweed. As the name implies, it's a host plant um, for the monarch butterfly. Um, or if you want a lot of butterflies in general, milkweed is kind of your secret weapon. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, Rattlesnake master is really good. Um, royal catchfly is really pretty for hummingbirds and things like that. Um, but just kind of also looking at like the sun and soil type you have, but just kind of putting in those native plants and including stuff like bird feeders, hummingbird feeders, bird baths, um, little puddle areas for butterflies and things like that is always really awesome. I'm going to try that. <laughs> well, Hannah Schwanke, thank you so much. Of conservation course. Conservation <laughs> steward, director of conservation here at the beautiful Douglas Hart, Na Douglas Hart <laughs> Nature Center in Mattoon. Thank you for joining us and spending a few moments talking about uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly of bugs yes. in our backyard. My pleasure. <laughs> love thank you. love thank joining you guys. Yes, <laughs> great. And thank you, our viewers, for joining us for this episode of The Paul Report. Until next time, we'll see you then. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Power Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, Authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. The Power Report on WEIU is supported by Rural King, America's farm and home store, livestock feed, farm equipment, pet supplies, and more. You can find your store and more information regarding Rural King at RuralKing.com. Additional support for the Paw Report provided from Soggy Paws of Mattoon.